Section 14 of Movies and Hollywood Short Story Collection, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Capricia Page. The Film of Fate, Part 1, by Josephine Dascom Bacon. Fifi's name was, I think, Sarah, not that I ever heard it. I suppose the bishop must have when he baptized her. She wore her father's grandmother's wedding veil, made into a christening robe on that occasion, and when the bishop asked her godparents if they, therefore, renounced in her name the world, the flesh, and the devil, Fifi gave a clear, distinct chuckle, which rang out through the Gothic arches. One of her godmothers, her Aunt Popsy, I forget what her real name is, too, one never hears it, looked very shocked and blushed violently at this. But everybody joked her mercilessly about it, and said no wonder the child had laughed. The only wonder was, they said, that she had blushed. Fifi's family was very well known, very rich, and very fashionable. You will readily conclude having doubtless read a great many novels, and seen a great many plays, that they were stupid and cold-hearted. I cannot blame you for this conclusion, which does you credit, in a way. But I must stop you before you go any further, and tell you you are quite in error. The Amorys were distinctly clever as a family, and far from cold-hearted, quite the contrary, in fact, if contemporary records are to be trusted. Stuvesant Amory, her father, said so many witty things that people never left the club until he did, for fear of missing one, and perhaps a little, so as to be sure that the next clever thing wouldn't be about them. Louise Schuler Crowlander, his wife's sister, would make the dullest dinner-party bearable, and his married daughter Patsy would not only make the most audaciously laughable remarks imaginable, but was wonderfully pretty, and utterly well-dressed into the bargain. It is too bad to have to shudder all the illusions of the really poor people, who certainly ought to have the monopoly of brains and charms so obligingly handed over to them by the magazines. But it isn't so. Some of the nicest, jolliest, most entertaining people I ever met were quite wealthy. That was the real trouble with Fifi, her family. She would have been easier to handle if she hadn't had so much competition. Her brother Stu was the best dancer in New York, her older sister Patsy the wittiest young matron, her younger sister Pips was considered by many people the most beautiful girl, though that was really mostly hair, some other people thought. Fifi had only her undoubted gift for amateur dramatics, and they had been out rather for some time now. In any other family she would have been a noticeably handsome, clever girl, but the Amorys were too much for her, and in self-defense she made herself a little odd. She bobbed her dark hair, which didn't curl and wore unusual frocks, all in one piece with no waistline, and long, dangly chains. She read strange novels, and stranger poetry, and had her room done in purple tapestry, with ebony furniture. She walked in the park very early, with a Russian wolfhound, and had an idea once of learning to play the harp, but found it too hard on the hands. Once she almost created a sensation by insisting that she had become a Mohammedan, and this really bothered her mother for a few days, but the bishop said not to mind at all, that there were really many worthy Mohammedans, one in particular a great friend of his, who repaired oriental rugs. He would arrange for Fifi to meet him, and then, as the bishop pointed out, she needn't be confined to books in her religious researches. After that, of course, there was no good going on with it. Patsy had actually, the year before she was married, written some clever little epigrams, 
They were done for a Halloween party, and her friends insisted on their being published. Stu could pick up any instrument and make a bluff at playing something on it. He once for a bet strung some picture wire across a frying pan and sang Annie Laurie to his own accompaniment. Pips at fifteen developed what was apparently a gift for modeling and made a table fountain that her teacher exhibited merely as a study. She took it up in the school infirmary after the measles. So that Fifi scorned the arts, and read, and walked with the wolfhound, and wore criss-cross sandals like somebody in Miss Austen's books. She did write some poems, but they were discovered on the eve of publication. She always insisted and violently suppressed. Even the bishop was staggered by the poems. He suggested that, as he had baptized her and confirmed her, he would appreciate the privilege of marrying her, and hinted that it had better be soon, as he was growing old, and many more poems like that would certainly prove more than he could stand. But here again Fifi just missed things. Between Patsy, who gobbled up all the young men, she liked her own husband so much, her father said, that she had a sort of claim on everybody else's. And Pips, whom older men adored to the point of extravagance. She was one of those young girls whose mothers are begged by every man to keep her for his son, if he can't have her. Fifi more or less faded out. She was neither as daring as Patsy nor as magnetic as Pips, and her cleverness began to turn a little sharp, which frightened the men terribly. At twenty-two she looked three years older. Then the inevitable happened. Having had every opportunity to meet the most eligible young men in the country, and many of other countries, what does Miss Fifi do but fall in love with a man twenty years older than herself, whom nobody had ever heard of? This might have been put up with, but unfortunately the man had a perfectly good wife of his own, a wife, moreover, who had no intention of losing him to an unprincipled society girl of the fast set, as she called Fifi. This was all very messy and complicated, and poor Mr. Amory had a bad six months of it. Patsy had stated more than once on very thin ice, and Stu had given them a fair amount of anxiety, but their vagaries were more understandable, more normal, so to say. A short-haired martyr, languishing in a purple bedroom, insisting that she must have a middle-aged professor of English literature from some freshwater college, was a little too much for the Amorys. They had no system to oppose the conditions. The professor, however, saw reason, and never meant to let things go as far as they did. He was really attached to his wife and children, and had been momentarily dazzled by a personality, and a society type hitherto unknown to him. It was all over before it had got to be too ridiculous and painful, and Mrs. Amory took Fifi abroad, at great personal inconvenience to herself, and everybody proceeded to forget it. Everybody, that is, but Fifi. She had enjoyed it very much while it lasted, as it was the first time in her life since her arrival in the family, when for a few weeks she had managed to hold the center of the stage that she had occupied everybody's attention. She had been really very fond of the professor, and the hours they had spent at tea-time, in odd places where there was no probability of anyone's meeting them, had been quite the most interesting hours of her life. She loved to think how his horrid, stupid wife misunderstood him, which wasn't entirely accurate, and how immensely happy she would have made him, which is possible, but not, I think, certain. So that the European summer, though it accomplished its purpose, practically speaking, left her dreamy and superior. Events, as she wrote in her diary, didn't interest her. Too much was going on in her heart. The summer of 1914, which sent them scuttling home in a steamer packed like a sardine box, meant to Fifi only the disgustingly crowded decks and the difficulty of getting American money quickly. The Amorys, like most of the rich and fashionable people of New York, got into the war long before the rest of the country. 
strangely enough instead of exercising their pekingese and inventing new tango steps they experimented with war breads encouraged the english men-servants to go home and enlist and busied themselves with pageants and tableaux and rummage sales and song recitals to send the great stream of american dollars that flowed to belgian relief patsy became the first secretary for the american fund for french wounded and worked all day at it long before the lusitania was sunk she had sent her eight hundredth bale of clothes and bandages and comforts across the wickedly dangerous atlantic stew dashed back into squadron a and was one of the first workers at the new aviation units mrs amory was lost in the meshes of the great practical reorganization of the red cross pips and three of her schoolmates started a cigarette and chocolate fund that soon outgrew their homes and ended in a vacant shop on madison avenue with a paid secretary and an auditor so efficiently did the young ladies manage an experiment which amused their families so much till the published totals of their collections began to rouse attention in the daily papers only fifi remained outside unswept into the great maelstrom i don't admire her for her self-centered thin-skinned little attitude only you mustn't condemn her for it either the girl simply hadn't found herself and the war hadn't done it for her she walked with the big hound in the park and read a great deal of french verse she thought the women's new craze for uniforming themselves supremely silly and pointed it out to her friends so clearly that they did not urge her to join them she was going she said to design a uniform for the few females left who weren't wearing any her father quoted this at the club. Well, the war wore along. Fifi hardly noticed that we were in it at last. Her family had always been in it. Stu was a major already. Mr. Amory had given and loaned so much money that heeding even one country place became a matter of close consideration. They regretted Fifi's tepid, sarcastic isolation but had little time or temper to give to it. Only once, when she said in her detached, drawling way that the sight of a woman knitting in a Fifth Avenue bus made her positively ill, her father turned on her. "'Don't you think this comes rather badly from you, my dear?' he said. I believe this to be the harshest remark Stuyvesant Amory ever addressed to a woman in his own family. Now we have come to the day when Fifi— sitting wearily through a war workers dinner that was to bring ten thousand dollars and signed pledges to mrs amory after the coffee listened to a chance remark of a clever discontented woman who suffered a little from her own malady of destructive criticism all this is very well said the woman who was divided between satisfaction at actually dining with the stew amorys and dissatisfaction because she knew full well why she had been invited all this is very well but your precious sammy is being stuffed with chocolates and fags and musical records and mufflers why his poor wife is doing his work it's just like women to pet the men and neglect their wives and children isn't it that's a wonderful idea mrs amory cried enthusiastically and you're just the woman to remedy that my dear why don't you take it up everybody applauded and the woman found herself a chairman before she left the table as fifi had agreed with her first remark and was notoriously disengaged she accepted with amused condescension a place on the executive committee and mr amory's airy suggestion of the little sisters of uncle sam was adopted unanimously well there you have it on tuesday an idea on wednesday a committee on thursday a headquarters on friday stamped letter paper the little sisters was booming in a fortnight you must take the publicity miss amory you're our only literary light said the chairman and fifi blushing slightly deprecating but really very much pleased consented they had their pictures taken in the picturesque capes with terracotta lining evolved by new york's principal sporting tailor for the occasions of their sisterly visits to sammy's relatives 
Fifi quite forgot her feeling on the matter of superfluous uniforms, and they were interviewed by the Sunday Times and the Saturday Sun. After that, really novel publicity proved difficult. People must take this more seriously, the chairman mused. If they only knew what practical, vital work we were doing, we must get it across to them somehow. What can we do, Miss Amory? Think of something. You are so clever. Why not? said Fifi sardonically, for the little sisters were beginning to bore her. Why not get it into the movies? That will put it across like the other war pictures. To her surprise, they caught at the suggestion wildly. Wonderful, they cried. My dear, you are simply too wonderful. Who shall we have to do it? And then in the next breath. Why, you, of course, Miss Amory. You write. You'll do it, won't you? Me, but I never wrote a— And all your dramatics. Why, you're practically a professional, everybody says. You're just the one. You'll know how to make it effective and— And plenty of go, you know. I might try, said Fifi slowly. You could show the soldier going away, and the house running down, and the mother sick and everything, and then the girls could show the home nursing, and the first aid and the recreation. There's our junior camp, you know, and all the other stunts. Oh, my dear, how perfectly wonderful, they cried. What will it cost, do you think? The war had caught Fifi at last. The next day but one she found herself sitting opposite a keen, polite gentleman at the little sister's headquarters, explaining somewhat nervously her idea of a moving picture. She talked a great deal and very fast. "'Of course I don't know anything about this,' she concluded breathlessly, "'but I've written out a little plot of—of of a sort of scenario, isn't it?' "'Give it here,' said the dark gentleman abruptly. "'Got the script here.' I suppose you want about two thousand feet. You gotta have two thousand feet. First twenty minutes to get the thing across. Regular rule. All worked out. Get some warmed up. I suppose you can put your hand on the cast for this. Oh! Fifi gasped, for he appeared to be reading her manuscript with one hand, and talking to her with the other, so to speak. Oh, there isn't any cast really, you see, just the little sisters themselves. Your sisters? I see. Young ladies in the league amateurs. All the better. Can't act, but the public likes it. Good title. Very good. We'll get you the soldier and the family up at the studio. Not practical, staging indoor stuff as a rule out of the studio. Not enough voltage. It can be done, of course. We can run wires anywhere, but cost like thunder in the end. Studio scenes at a hundred a day. A hundred? Fifi queried confusedly. Dollars. Five hundred a reel outside. Four hundred, really, but allow one studio day to each. A thousand for the two. Cover everything. Transportation mostly. Machine very delicate. Fine effects here for the children in camp, I see. Fifi perceived that the marvelous man had really read the manuscript and seen what she had intended to convey. Then you think you could do something with it? Make it over, I mean? She asked humbly. Very good script indeed, he answered briskly. Practically no suggestions myself. Good captions, too. May have to add to em a little here and there. Average house, perfect fools, you know. Minds travel slow. You mean it will do as it is? Of course it'll do. Very good script. Much better than I expected, he snapped. My goodness gracious! She breathed and rushed into the committee room to report. In five minutes she had raised the money required. Two of the finance committee agreed to underwrite the film. Now I may have given you a lower idea of Fifi's powers than his quite just to the child. She had done the little sister's film very cleverly. She had a really dramatic mind, you see, and instead of presenting a series of pictures of the activities of her particular organization, she had selected one little girl in a poor soldier's family to be the object of all the direct and indirect advantages flowing from the little sisters of Uncle Sam. This made a more or less connected narrative and centered the interest in the child in question, whom she hoped to pick from the vacation camp supported by the little sisters, where happy relays of two weeks' guests swam and drilled and cooked and slept in the open. Fifi had instinctively realized that this camp, though only one of their activities, would make the best showing on the screen, and had laid many of her scenes there. 
building up the picture from the prospectus of the Committee on Activities and the glowing reports of the camp directoress, an experienced social worker. "'I suppose there's no doubt the kids can do all these stunts,' suggested Mr. Ficken on the occasion of his second visit to headquarters, to arrange for his sleeping and eating accommodations during the camp days ahead of them. "'Oh, I don't think so,' Fifi answered vaguely. "'That's what they're there for, isn't it?' "'All right. Up to you,' he said briefly. "'Take us five days. Only three, really, but allow for bad weather. My assistant and a cameraman and a chauffeur. Your camp lady says tea house will do for us, three miles from her outfit. You going up by train? I suppose so, she answered vaguely, wondering if her father would let her have the small car for that length of time, and perhaps the second chauffeur, who was rather stupid and liable to be drafted any day into the bargain. We can take you up, he added suddenly. Stick you in, I dare say. If you don't mind cameras, cars is seven passenger so that Miss Fifi Amory found herself battened down on the back seat of a dingy but powerful car, under a pile of blankets and tripods, between Mr. Ficken and his photographer, a mild, short-sighted little man with a pointed beard and an apologetic manner. Beside the chauffeur, a headstrong New York cockney in a flannel shirt, sat the assistant, a taciturn young man with a scornful expression, and a tendency to disagree with everybody as to their exact whereabouts at any given time, the likelihood of their arriving at the camp at all, and the possibility of getting any pictures that week, as he had read in the only paper he ever perused, a Western publication, that the next seven days would be cloudy. Fifi thought them all immensely amusing. That they thought of her at all is extremely doubtful, for you see they had no idea who she was. Mr. Ficken had been summoned to their interview by a pompous lady with a rope of pearls too big not to be real. The other ladies in the office called each other by their first names, but they called her Miss Amory. He saw a slender, odd-looking girl with bobbed hair, a queer-looking velvet frock, and a jet chain down to her knees. Her shoes were different from other people's, an excited spot of carmine on each cheekbone he mistook for rouge, her coldness when addressed by the lady with the pearls he took for shyness. He placed her somewhere between a newspaper woman and an actress, and gave the matter no further thought. The little scenario was a pleasant surprise for him. He usually had to write them over. Mrs. Amory had no idea that Fifi was to be the only woman of the party. She knew that the directoress of the camp was a perfectly capable matron, and that Fifi would be in her tent during her stay. There were only girls and young women there, and men were all she feared in her daughter's case, ever since the episode of the Professor of English. Naturally, she didn't count the picture-taking persons as men at all. She gave her daughter blankets and bed-boots and a trench mirror she had bought at a bazaar for a soldier, and told her maid to see that Miss Fifi's maid put in a pair of high boots and plenty of woolen sport stockings. Then she went back to the Red Cross. If she had seen her daughter eating lunch at a Yonkers tea house, with a taciturn young man who smoked cigarettes steadily through the meal, she might have been considerably more disturbed than she was that day. I guess you and the young lady better grab a table loot, and the boss and I leave out here and keep an eye on the car. Henry has to chase out for some distilled water, or so he says, the little photographer remarked, and the young man answered indifferently. All right, anything suits me. "'This is great fun, isn't it, Mr. Leert? Fifi gurgled, stuffing tea-house chicken pie with gusto. "'Anything's fun if you say so, I suppose,' he answered absently, pulling out an old envelope and jotting down figures on it while he ate. She flushed a little, but decided to take it humorously. "'What do you think is fun?' she said good-naturedly. "'Oh, well,' he replied vaguely and drank a great cup of coffee in two gulps, his eyes on his figures. She bit her lip and ate in silence, which— evidently impressed him as little as her speech, he was no more of a ladies' man than his boss. Once at the camp, events moved fast. A lot of excitable little girls of uneven sizes and dispositions were lined up before Fifi and Director Ficken, from which wriggling mass they were to select a heroine for their melodrama. "'I'll pick them out for screen types, and you find out if they're good for the stunts,' he said hastily. 
Get all this camp stuff out of the way first, and take him to the village for street scenes. How about your young society girl stuff? Forgot to bring one, didn't we? Wasn't she to come in in the village part? He looked annoyed. An able man, considering all things in their proper place and order, he had been neglectful. Oh, I'll do that, said Fifi easily. She doesn't come in much, you know. He scratched his head thoughtfully. Hmm, yes. I guess we'll have to let it go at that, he agreed. Too bad we didn't think of it, though. You couldn't have got one of those regular members, a real astrobilt or something. We must try to for the studio scenes. Make a note of it, both of us. Public likes it. Fifi was honestly puzzled. Why wouldn't she do? She had been one of the principal features of the debutante's league film, and much in demand for it. Did he think her too old, perhaps, or not enough of a novelty? She decided that he feared she couldn't act and manage at the same time. That tall girl with the blue eyes would be awfully good, I think, she suggested, but he shook a decided head. Look, sixteen, nineteen in the picture. No point in it. Might be an actress. Want to be convincing. How about the dark, wavy-haired one? Three from the end, always laughing, fine eyes. And that clever, short one just behind. She's very graceful. They collected five promising young ladies and reported to the directoress. But Mrs. Compton shook her neat braided head with fatal displeasure. Oh, dear me, Miss Amory, that will never do. You can't pick out the pretty ones like that very well. They're jealous enough already. Two girls left last night because I told them they couldn't be in the drill scenes. But we must have them good-looking, Mrs. Compton. They're to be the principal ones. All the more reason for picking them out for some good reason, said Mrs. Compton firmly. Now all those girls you have selected would be the very worst ones possible. Beatrice is regularly late for reverie each morning. Helen Priestley gets bad marks for her tent every night, laughing and talking. Alma is self-conscious and affected enough without having her head turned by this sort of thing. Fifi gazed at her in dumb despair. Her plump and placid bulk, her sweet reasonableness, her firm matronly readiness for every juvenile emergency put her beyond the reach of argument. Who? Which ones can we have, then? The impresario asked meekly. Well, said Mrs. Compton judicially, there is a fine girl here who's made a lot of progress. I'm much interested in her, Miss Amory, and I'm sure that all the young ladies who have done so much to make the camp possible will be, too. She swims well and does excellent first aid and really understands camp cooking. That sandy-haired girl, the second from the right on the third row, Sadie Rottenkind. She's not pretty, of course, but she has a fine, serious face when you study it. I'll ask Mr. Ficken, Fifi murmured after a hasty glance at Sadie. Mr. Ficken threw up his hands and yelped nervously. Good God, he cried, what's the matter with this woman anyway? What we come up here for? To make a picture or give rewards for merit? That's not up to us. Tell her. Tell her we're here to get something over. How about that fat little blonde one in the back there? She'd scream first rate. Fifi inquired and came back sadly. No. What's her trouble? He queried sourly. She only came last night. She hasn't got the real atmosphere of the camp yet. She's got atmosphere enough for me, he answered obstinately. Tell her to can that Sadie stuff anyhow. Start em on some games and marching to begin. We'll never get anywhere this way. Fifi was to remember those four days in camp as the strangest of her life. End of section 14 Recording by Capricia Page